button. Yes. Um, welcome to uh, Art 490, Artists Portfolio Websites. I guess it's Career Day, Career Workshop. Uh, I'm joined by artist and arts educator Nicole Hebron and by Long Beach State uh, Career Center liaison to the College of the Arts, Rosa Trujillo. Nicole and Rosa, thanks for joining me. Um, so I know you both have actually specific content that we'll get to in just a minute. Um, but I think one thing that I've felt is that some of the students almost aren't sure that an art diploma is not just a piece of paper that you put on the wall, but it, it isn't an actual career. And I wonder if we might start just with a few sort of pep talk words that art can be more than a piece of paper, a diploma can be the beginning of an actual career. Yeah, I can start if that's all right. Um, I, I recently heard the word hustlepreneur for the first time. And um, I think that's um, it's a reality that a lot of people are facing this uh, in the gig economy, right? The need to kind of hustle and be an entrepreneur all the time or to hustle entrepreneurial positions all the time. And I think, um, I think an arts degree is actually the best degree to help you do that. Like it is an arts degree teaches you um, to cr critical thinking. It teaches you to be able to kind of assess the world and the conditions and the materials around you and apply them in innovative ways. Like it, it teaches you, it gives you the, the capacity to um, be analytical and critical, but also creative in the problem solving that you need to do. I think of art often as, as, as being either um, a tool for problem solving or a tool for asking questions. I use art as a way to learn more about myself and the world around me. Um, so I think that it used to be that that like parents would hear you're going to school for art and get a little worried, you know, they're like, oh, um, are you sure? You know, like it's cool when you want to put art on the refrigerator when you're five, but when you want to go and get a college degree in it, parents get nervous, right? Um, but I think uh, now it's sort of flipped, like now it's probably one of the more valuable and applicable um, degrees even if you're not going to be, say, a career artist, it is, it's a degree that will help you in social media management and help you in running a gallery, help you in doing kind of community activism work, help you in visualizing, say, immersive um, environmental design, which is, you know, can be applied everywhere from game design to AR to immersive experiences to museum um, design and curation. So I think that it's actually a really exciting degree to be having, especially now in as we're in this phase of the pandemic and the world is hybrid, everything is hybrid and um, everyone needs to kind of navigate different platforms in their, in their lives and in their work. Um, and if you can do that with creative innovation, I think you are going to be, um, you'll have a, a leg up. Yes. Oh my goodness. Like so many snaps to all your statements. I feel like um, one of the things that at least resonated with me when you were talking is that whole parent conversation. And I think more and more it's like, and it doesn't, I mean, it could be an art degree, it could be like a degree in, in liberal arts, a degree where maybe our folks and their past generations didn't yet fathom what that career could look like or have different notions of what that career is. And so um, a funny story that I always think of is when my brother was pursuing animation, um, the term artist for my mom who grew up in Mexico was an artist was someone that did art on the street. And so she couldn't fathom that the things that she was watching on the screen was actually an artist doing that. And so a lot of our first generation artists, first generation professionals, that is the extra work we are doing, which is you are literally creating and translating something that has yet to be seen by the folks around you. And so um, 
I always applaud our College of the Arts students because you're doing two things. You're one, discovering who you are as an artist, as a creative, as a designer, as a performer, sometimes all of that, one of those things. But then at the same time, you want to bring everyone with you in this journey, whether it is your folks um, that may have, um, again, not fathomed other careers other than like, you know, lawyer, doctor, um, teacher, right? And you're doing that additional work to, again, bring them with you in this journey. So, um, so that note of like, yeah, sometimes you're explaining your career or that formation, that becoming process and not the final product to those that really love you. Um, so I always like have this conversation with students because I'm like, I, I feel you. It's the first generation, um, first generation artist kind of like work that is done that is sometimes not talked about. And it's not just getting a degree. It's like you literally carry your folks, your family, your chosen family, your friends with you in this process. That is why when we see our students graduate on their caps, it is always a dedication to their chosen family, their friends, their, fa their, their family, family. Um, because you take them with you. And so um, I think one of the things that also popped up um, in my mind is, is absolutely correct. Uh, the industries that we see today are calling more and more on the creative mind. Um, and it's so hard because you are so much immersed in your world as College of the Arts students that you're like, well, creativity is something that I know because I've lived in it. I've worked with it. But when you step outside of that, and you talk with an engineering student, you talk with the College of Liberal Arts student, you talk with the student that's in College of Education, your skill set is so unique that they cannot fathom how you are problem solving in such a unique way. So sometimes because we're just looking at ourselves and saying, well, of course, everybody that I know is creative. But when you go into these industries, more and more, it is asking, how are we being innovative? How are we... Um, pushing the limits of problem solving. Um, and again, the creation process, which is so, so important. Um, so I equally agree. I feel that um, right now your degree as a creative, um, one, it doesn't dictate what you're going to do. It's that you're not going to attach to it. You still have that ultimate choice. But two, you're such a gift to these industries and they are literally calling for your creativity. Um, but I think, uh, thinking about like, you know, imposter syndrome and like just thinking of ourselves and saying, but I'm not enough. Um, that always is a trick to, to our minds. We're like, well, we need to prove ourselves as creatives. We need to be, but you are already like the best thing ever. You are that dream come true for all your ancestors and all the creatives before us. Right. So, um, if we were talking about pep talk, that those are the first things that come to mind that your degree is valuable. Um, not because of the piece of paper, but simply because you as a person came to this world to shift the way we think, to shift the way we're going to connect with one another. And I cannot, as a person that is a, in a non-creative sector and non-creative job function, I cannot imagine my world without your creativity. I don't think we would have survived the pandemic without such creativity that stems from social media like TikTok all the way down to um, healthcare and thinking about mindfulness and mental health and how our creatives also ventured into that. And not only that, but social justice as well. So those are some of my thoughts <laughs> for sure. So I, I had one uh, student in one of my general ed classes. Um, she was a nursing major and her dad was a, a Russian computer programmer. And when she told him she wanted to do nursing, he was really surprised. And he said, nursing, really? Are you sure you don't want to get an art degree? <laughs> so um, that doesn't happen super often, but maybe it will more now. Um, I hope so. Anyway, I know you both actually have some, some content that you can share with us. Um, Nicole, do you want to start with you? Sure. Can I screen share? You should be able to, yes. Great. Okay. Um, so I have, I, I actually thought I would jump, uh, jump ahead to these two images. If I can, I'm using Google slides, which I don't usually do. So maybe that was a mistake, but here we go. 
Um, since we were talking about parents and such, I thought these two graphics were really funny. I mean, they're old at this point, but I love it. Like kind of relating art to drugs, right? Like one in five teenagers will experiment with art. Um, do you want to end up like an illustrator, like your sister <laughs> drawing? Then you're, then it's full on graphic design. Um, mom, I was just holding those for friends. And, um, and then this one where I don't know if you remember that meme where it's like, here's what, you know, my friends think I do. Here's what I, you know, here's my mom thinks I do. Here's what I actually do. Um, and I think, I think it could be updated for, you know, kind of the social media gig economy universe, but um, I, I'll jump, I'll jump back up to the top and um, was going to give a few, a little, just a little overview of the kinds of things that I do. And then I have some, like some, some tips, some like hard, hard facts and advice and maybe not facts, but uh, truths, truths and tips. Um, I, I do a lot of things. I converted my, my garage, the garage in my um, backyard into a mini gallery called the Situation Room. And that's this community space where I have all kinds of things happen from exhibitions to film festivals to um, uh, gatherings and um, performances, stuff like that. Um, I run a summer camp program in Utah um, at a friend's ranch in central Utah. I also do a version of this in northern France. So it's sort of like a residency, like a 10-day residency program. Um, I inadvertently became the, uh, uh, I was memefied in a, a project that I did in 2014 and it went viral in 2015, which was to combat social media censorship of female nipples. And um, I was at an exhibition and I, I was topless at this exhibition, which was a, a fundraiser for breast cancer. And it was a hundred artists making boob art. And I am um, trying to drum up attention for this project. I, I, um, I agreed to attend Topless if 100 people would confirm that they were going to the show and would you know, hopefully bid on the art. Facebook censored the images of my performance within less than 24 hours. And so in a sarcastic response, I, I reposted all the images with male nipple pasties um, and they stayed up. So then that, you know, the rest was history. I can talk about that later if people want. There's a bunch of images of me, self-port, digital, digital um, illustrations and self-portraits where I'm kind of playing around with what, what's acceptable and what's not. I do a lot of, my individual work is a lot about um, identity and uh, sexuality, nudity, um, social constructs. This was a series from 2010, actually long before the nipple pasty. Um, and then recently, actually this week, um, there's a project opening in Miami that I did in conjunction with Playboy magazine. I was commissioned to do a huge project for them. Um, and uh, along the way, I, I was I was invited very last minute. So it was this like really rushed situation of developing um, a wrap for a room that was a cell that uh, presented as a selfie booth. And um, along the way, as I was having the Playboy design team kind of uh, do quality control on my designs, uh, the director there told me that the two members of their design team are actually um, Chapman University alumni and student, former students of mine. So here I am ten, like 10 years later, um, they are now working doing graphic design for Playboy and copy editing my work, which I thought was pretty amazing. That um, is amazing. Right? I was so excited. So. That's for a project uh, that's called Skin in the Game, and it's a really exciting project about kind of touch and bodies. Um, here's some- And, it, and just opened today. It just opened, uh, yeah, there was actually yesterday, there was a media preview yesterday, and um, it's opening this, yeah, it's open now for media, for Art Week in Miami. So here's the piece, like you go into the room and you can, you can be like a cover model on, on the Playboy and the Playboy mirror with my designs all around. Um, another project I did that I, I got known for was to start tallying the ratios of male and female and non-binary artists in galleries around the world. And I, I collaborated with hundreds of people to make graphic design posters, original um, data visualizations of poster, um, posters that represented the statistics of male, female, and non-binary artists at contemporary galleries around the world. And, and what we learned was that of, of the 500 plus galleries that we tallied, it's still 70% male identifying artists. Um, so that's pretty grim. 
Um, and then I also make other projects that are like sort of wish fulfillment. This is a five and a half foot tall crystal vulva uh, made out of 300 pounds of quartz crystal, but it's also a fountain. And so you can walk up to it and it pours out pina coladas. So you can walk up to the vulva fountain and have a delicious intoxicating um, elixir to drink from. Um, I did some, I did some AR works with Nancy Baker Cahill. This is a project over the border of, um, uh, Texas and Mexico near McAllen, Texas. Um, and I collaborated with the students there, students who live both on either side of, on you know, both sides of the border. Um, and we, they were attending the university of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. And these are all their eyes. And we created, it's actually a video when you're, when you're in this space and you can see a cluster of their eyes over the border wall, kind of returning the gaze of the border patrol. Um, and you can see it from either side of the border. It's also right, it, ironically, this is the site of a, of a butterfly preserve. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, butterflies being a symbol of migration, but there's this giant border fence there. So like the butterflies can go back and forth, but the humans can't. Um, it's just a really intense space. I've seen, I've seen a number of, of border AR pieces, and it seems like that problematic zone is just so ideal for these AR installations. Yeah, yeah. And we did this, and this was also in 2017, I think. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of surveillance happening there. I wanted to show you some pieces I did in high school because it's always you know fun to embarrass yourself. Um, but I thought, wow, some things never change. So like, here's this piece, this like dystopia piece where it's like all these like white women being hooked up to milking machines and they're all pregnant. And now like, speaking of Texas, there are actually maternity farms, uh, in Texas, no joke, like full on, full on handmaid's tale. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the cold war. Oops. I don't know what, um, and uh, and was making a mural about wanting um, the then USSR Russia to to kind of make nice with the United States. Uh, and this was the beginning of my controversial artwork. For one of the teachers in my high school tried to get me kicked out of school because they thought this was um, this was witchcraft. They thought I was actually sneaking in a, a mural about witchcraft and communism. Oh. <laughs> Thankfully, they didn't kick me out. Um, here's my stats like like how i identify i i also my parents didn't go to college um one my grandfather went to to college but um Den like was always looking down on my degree even though i got an mfa at the then top art school in the country um it was never considered to be like a real degree which i thought was you know really frustrating um I grew up, I grew up intermittently homeless. I have a chronic autoimmune disease. Um, I, my mother died when I was 20, you know, so I feel like I had a lot of, I, I did a lot of it on my own um, and kind of pursuing an art degree on your own. Uh, there's no one to tell me to do it or not to do it. <laughs> so I was just pursuing what I loved. Um, and I can get into this more later if we want, but, but here's some of the jobs I had. Like I started working at 14 and I never stopped. I have never not worked. Uh, so I've been a florist, a house cleaner. I usually like, clean house for my piano teacher site in exchange for piano lessons. because I want to learn how to play piano. Um, I was, a, I was an underage bartender. So I worked, probably shouldn't tell you that, but like I hustled, like I wasn't a hustlepreneur, but I was a hustler. Um, so I got a job at a, I was at, a, at a, this pop-up cafe in San Francisco. I was a caterer. I, I worked as a conservation technician at um, LA County Museum of Art. Nothing that I ever imagined I would do. So when you have opportunities, even if it's like adjacent to what you think you wanna do, say yes. Just say yes, because you never know what's gonna come out of that. So like I applied for a job in education. I wanted to work in the education department at LA County Museum of Art. And they were not having me. Like, I think I was too, like, I probably was too foul mouthed. I wasn't, I was not professional enough. I was really casual. You know, I don't know. I was aggressive and I was, I was really like a go-getter, but I wasn't, I wasn't confined enough for them. Um, and I went back to the HR department there and I was like, okay, they didn't give me that job. What else do you have? Like, I didn't let that rejection stop me. I went back to them and I was like, give me another entry level position to apply for. And they had one in the conservation department 
And I'll tell you, as I'm, I'm, I'm a multimedia artist. I'm not a technically proficient artist. I'm, I'm a concept. I work more with conceptual things. So, the idea of working very specifically in the area of technique, like conservation, was kind of like a, a complete anomaly to me. I ended up being the studio manager and lead conservator for a private arts con conservator who ended up paying me enough to put me through grad school. Like I worked for her through all of grad school and it was my, um, it was my bread and butter. So it was worth it. I've, I've been a reviews writer for magazines and I've been a teacher at all levels from kindergarten to post-grad. Uh, so we can talk about that later too. My areas of interest artistically um, are, are broad. Like I'm interested in memes and social constructs. I'm interested in trauma and foreign pedagogy and autobiography, the natural world and the digital world. All right, but you want, I'm gonna jump ahead to my, my recommendations for you. Here are the things I think they don't talk about in art school that you should think about. Storing your art, ruining the environment, nepotism, family money, investing, debt, medical and health, medical care, health insurance, parenting, um, relationships, taking care of yourself, ethics and integrity, um, living, dying, um, sexual assault, abuse, PTSD. Like you, we so often go through, you know, school or work and no one talks about like, what if you're going through work as a single mom who is suffering PTSD? What if you're going through, you know, trying to get a job as someone who, you know, who doesn't have a trust fund, who has an autoimmune condition or healthcare needs and you need health insurance, you may not be able to work uh, like the kind of hours that they're expecting. Like there's all kinds of things that we don't you know when we're going to talk about alcoholism and addiction, like there was severe alcoholism in my family. Um, and I was never offered any resources for that. Like while, while I was in school, for example, I've, I've found them later. Um, we already took a lot, looked at this. This is my, my, my cynical thoughts about the art world. It's like all the little people kind of holding up the big ones, like this, the black shiny shoe. Um, so you don't want to be either of these people. I think, you know, I want there to be a much more kind of, um, co collaborative, uh, model. So this is actually a, an elaboration of a talk I gave at Cal State Long Beach some years ago, and I kind of updated it. Um, I, and I came and did a presentation for Glamfa. Um, but 10 ideas of, uh, you know, what to do now, I'll try to keep it short, but you can cut me off, Glenn, if you're like, okay, that's enough for now. And if you need me to let Rosa talk, um, please tell me. Should I pause? Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Um, one, be real with yourself. Like, what do you want? What do you expect? And why are you doing this? I think a lot of times we don't like, I was in, I was in grad school. I'm like, yeah, I wanted to be in the Whitney museum. And I wanted to be in the, I wanted to get, be, be, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to, I wanted to have big show, like shows in big museums. Now, but somehow we weren't so, supposed to admit those things. And I think like admit what you really want and then think about how you get there. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, kind of think about why you're not like, you know, um, what is it that you're not saying out loud about what your internal expectations and hopes are with your art and with your career? Like, are you, you know, do you want to get picked up by a gallery? Do you want to make history? Do you want to be um, a social justice advocate? Do you want to be acknowledged you know, for being an idea, a thought leader? Do you want to be acknowledged for being technically amazing and, you know, at painting? Like, what is it that you, that is, it is really what you, what you hope for and what you want? Um, and what part of the art world do you, do you imagine you would be happiest in? It doesn't have to be as a studio artist. There are so many ways to be involved in the art world or to be creative, um, in a gallery as you're, you know, in, in, as a programmer, as a designer, as a collector, as a writer, as a curator. I mean, there's a lot of ways. So don't limit your, your conception of what's possible to just like being in a studio. Um, and as cheesy as it sounds, every single person has their own trajectory. I can tell you exactly how I got to where I got, but nobody else is ever going to do it the same way. Um, your circumstances, your, uh, your, um, what you encounter, your experiences are all going to be unique to you. Um, and the most important thing is for you to be present in your own, for yourself and in your own life and for those opportunities and for those experiences. Um, don't sit on your ideas. 
someone else will do them. And or, or worse than that, someone else will get recognition for a similar but crappier idea. And then you'll be really mad. So talking about imposter syndrome, just do them. Like whatever ideas you've got, do them. Put them out there and do them. Like you're going to have ideas your whole life, hopefully. Um, but so don't sit on them. Like be, and, and when someone steals your idea, be ready with another one. You know, um, treat your art like a job. Treat your creative practice like a job. Even if you are not working for another thing, put in the time, be regulated about it, be committed. The people that I know who are the most successful with their studio practice are the ones like, I mean, it's successful. I mean, like selling their pieces for five and six and seven figures. These are the people who, who go to the studio eight hours a day or more, um, who carve out time and protect their creative endeavors because that's what they want. That's where they want their energies to go. Um, prepare job materials and a portfolio. I would say like right now, if you haven't already put, make a Google drive and have these things accessible um, from anywhere and have them updatable from anywhere. So a cover letter, your artistic statement, two versions of your bio, a portfolio of 10 to 20 images, a works list, your website, your social media pages, a reference, like names, addresses, and contacts for references. And if you need a letter, you know, eventually you'll be able to ask them, but have at the ready three people that you can put on job applications or grant, for, you know, grant applications, whatever. Um, and if you think you might want to be teaching, start to write your teaching philosophy and a diversity and inclusion statement. What are your beliefs about that? So, um, and looking for jobs, I think Rosa can probably talk about this a lot too, but I, th I talk and think mostly about looking for jobs in the art sector, specifically like galleries and museums. Galleries, call them up. Do you have any openings for internships? Are you looking for an assistant? Like they don't always post it. A lot of it is internal and word of mouth. So call them up and ask. Just say, you know, keep me in mind. Where can I look to see when you have an opening? Just ask them. Most museums have an HR site or a jobs board or an employment opportunities page. Um, create a space for yourself so you know where to make your work. You have somewhere to make your work. It can be a desktop. It can be a patio. It can be a studio. You don't have to have like a rich, you know, fancy big studio space. Um, but have a space that can facilitate your studio practice um, or your creative practice. And think about, you know, what kind of space you do need to do that best. What's the cost of production for the work that you want to do? If you're making physical objects, you're going to have to store them somewhere unless they're selling. So like there's either a really big incentive to sell that work or to get the money to pay for storage, or you're going to have to dump it. And then you're part of like the problem of like making junk in the world. So I think like avoid, you know, contributing to the ecological crisis that we're seeing. Also think about sharing space. It's really good to be in a creative community with others so you can share experiences with each other. Um, I'm a huge fan of plans. I think it also, even if you don't necessarily stick to the plan, you will, that make you, the act of making a plan will help you admit some of the things that you might want or, or, or the things that you may not be sure about and you need to fill in. I recommend a one, a three, a five, and a 10 year plan for your personal, your artistic, and your financial goals. And see, like, be again, like, be honest with yourself. Like, where, where do you want your art to be in five years? Where do you want your family to be? Are you, do you want to have kids? Do you want to have a partner? Do you want to travel the world? Like, what are the things that you want? And how, are, how can you start laying the foundation for those things? These plans will help you negotiate when it comes to take, getting a job too. Right. So and it's known across the board that female identifying people are so much less likely to negotiate for raises and higher salaries. So like practice negotiating, make if you know how much money you're going to need to make in a year in order to support your current lifestyle and to lay a foundation for your goal, your plans and your goals, that will empower you to make sure that you're kind of out the gate aiming for jobs that are going to pay you what you need and what you deserve. Um, if you have the capacity, hire a financial advisor, meet with an accountant, like learn about how to do your taxes, do financial planning. I don't know. I don't know if you have that at school as an avail as something available, but I also find that schools across the country don't are very 
tend to be very negligent about advising students for financial planning, particularly when it comes to student loans. It's like, if you have student loans, like it's, it's, it don't just rely on that like six month grace period. Cause you're like, well, I'll figure it out after that. And then, whoa, you're going to be totally surprised. Cause like Sally Mayer, whoever it is now coming like vampire coming after you for like everything that you make. Um, and you don't want that. So I would say, make sure you know, what are your financial obligations now? What are the financial obligations coming down the pike and how can you prepare for them? Um, there's an amazing account at, on Instagram called her first 100 K that I totally recommend. There's also a few books that I, I recommend, um, on, on, um, just like being, being money smart. Um, do you, I feel like that's, a, that's number five. Should I, maybe that's a good place to pause and Rosa can kind of step in or what do you think? Yeah. Great idea. Let's do that. <laughs> I was going to be like, it's, it's up to y'all. Um, let me share my screen really quickly. So let's start from here. Um, so my content is very specific to kind of um, what we offer. Let me just uh, switch the display settings here. Um, but what we kind of offer in the Career Development Center and then how, how are we uniquely serving our College of the Arts students? So one of the things that I like to share with um, uh, with our counselors, but also with our students too, is like the career counselor approach is very, very different. So I don't treat, um, you know, your unique needs uh, in a way where it's just like dismissive. I really kind of put into context what makes you unique as a CSULB CODA student, right? So some of the things that I take into account is just your use of creativity to problem solve. So that opens up doors to what you might be interested in. Um, that you're very unique in that your professors serve as role models and mentors and guides in the process. So many times when we have career counseling sessions with one another, we invite those professors um, as as like those additional figures in your life to help you shape that career path for you um, with you. And then of course that your creativity goes beyond the creative sector, right? It, uh, that alumni from CSULB have had creative degrees and they've gone to completely different arenas. Um, and so we, so we definitely have that conversation with you, um, but also something so unique uh, to CODA students is you know how to take feedback and incorporate it. Um, a lot of our other majors on campus may just get a letter grade and that's it, while you are constantly hearing feedback and trying ways to incorporate that. And in, definitely in any industry and field, that is so unique. Because um, you can get people that are very defensive. You can get people that will hear the feedback but not know how to incorporate it. And our College of the Arts students are really great in getting that because you're in that unique environment. Um, so we always tend to talk about that. The other thing that I always say too um, is that creatives have a strength um, through their work in empathy, um, that you constantly engage with uh, humanity and that philosophy of life. So, um, so that's something that we tend to talk about too. Like, are there career paths that you're interested in because it's calling to the work that you've already been doing um, at Cal State Long Beach? Um, and so that's why, and, and there's more listed here. I won't read all of them off, but this is kind of like our approach approach the Career Development Center to really think about how can we serve you in this career counseling space. Um, one of the things that I also like to share with students um, is this is coming from Otis's uh, economic report that happens yearly. Um, but this is one screenshot that I love to share with our College of the Arts students just to show you that you don't necessarily have to fit a certain mold, that there have been creatives that stay in the creative industry and do the creative art. Um, but there are some that do the creative art, not in the creative industry. And then we have even some students that are so in love with the creative industry, but their job function is um, is not creative. So accounting students that want to be an accountant for a museum is a good example. And then you also have our creatives that get a creative degree, um, but they don't want to do anything creative, nor do they want to be in the creative sector. And in all of these areas, uh, this economic report has kind of counted um, folks within these, these areas. So I usually tell students, and we begin this conversation with, one, you don't have to fit in any of these squares, but know that you have 
uh, power that this little piece of paper, don't give it power. You're the one that has the power. So if you feel like, you know what, I, I've learned and gained so much with my degree, but I see myself in this other arena, this other sector, things that we haven't even imagined yet, go for it, right? I really love the idea of, um, you know, again, you need to self kind of be self-aware of what you're looking for and also what you don't know. I, I think a lot of us feel the pressure of wanting to know everything in the forefront. In the Career Development Center, we definitely open the space. If you don't know, this is a space to talk about it. Just like you have spaces in the classroom, you have spaces with your mentors, you have spaces with friends and family to kind of say like, hey, I, I know I kind of want this. I just don't know what this might look like. So um, I always introduce to students like one, how unique you are and the skill sets that are actually being sought by in all industries, not just the creative sector, um, but also that these are some of the things you want to start thinking about. Who are you? Right. And that could be a conversation we can have in, in our career counseling sessions that I have with students. Um, and also researching. It's really great to one, as you're watching this video, you're learning so much about other folks, but continuously engaging by look, going to your local um, areas and, and creative spaces, talking with people, um, literally researching what you want to do doesn't have to be stuck in a computer, right? It can be, but talking with strangers, figuring out how they figured things out. These are these are other areas for you to kind of like, again, dream about this career. Um, so as a career center, we have these models to kind of help you start formulating these thoughts, brainstorming, having a space for that. Um, and our career services are unique in that one, we do offer that one-on-one. -on -one. So if you are more like Rosa, I would love to sit down with you. Um, Again, we can treat the session as a brainstorming session, um, figuring out who you are, everything down to like, I really need to start in those documents that I saw. Uh, maybe I need to work on that diversity statement and, and inclusion and equity statement, or, or I have to start looking at my resume. How do I format that based on the industries I'm interested in? Everything under the sun, we can definitely talk about. Um, and then we also have even short one-on-one -on -one sessions where you can get feedback on resume and cover letter. So um, that is something that we do also advertise. And, and part of the one-on-one -on -one experience too, is you feel kind of like that space where you're just like, I can be who I am. I can ask these questions. I can say out loud, maybe what I'm afraid to say with other family members and friends, because this space really is just a lot about exploration and prepping you. Um, we also have programs and services that um, are also very, um, could, like a uh, community space based. So we do have internship week where you're diving into these topics of like, what is it that you're looking for in an internship? What are these search engines? How can you find these opportunities? Um, webinars on any type of career topic from like networking all the way down to like looking at your LinkedIn profiles, resume, cover letters, you name it. Anything that has to do with your career, we could have a webinar on and then we definitely have our industry speaker series where we invite folks to share their stories and strategies and to share space with you to kind of like help you think about mm, that sounded interesting. How can I learn more about it? So a lot of our programs really are about like communal spaces. How do you sit with other students that have a very similar question about their career path, um, but then also how do you like explore that within yourself. What questions do you come up with and what additional service do you have? A lot of our service and programs are also in collaboration with others. So we may be doing um, collaborations with your individual college, like College of the Arts. We could also be doing collaborations, like uh, in the past, we did a collaboration with our counseling and psychological service for our webinar, I'm graduating now what, where we tackled career anxiety and talking about, um, what are the strategies? So we actually invited um, a CAPS counselor to kind of introduce what are some strategies while we kind of also mesh together. Here are some, here are some techniques to kind of um, address those career questions while also um, being aware that, yes, 
trying to figure all of this out can create anxiety, can create a lot of pressure, but there are ways and strategies. So we've partnered in the past with our counseling and psychological service. We've uh, partnered with um, student life and development with our welcomes. Um, so you will see us just across, uh, across campus collaborating with our fellow partners in bringing you career content, but also allowing that thinking space, that self-reflection space to then be complemented with the one-on-one -on -one session. So that's kind of like how we work in the Career Center. Um, and then, of course, when you're thinking about, well, Rosa, I cannot access all these things. How do I get information um, about careers, about these documents that I need to formulate, right? We have our website, which is careers.ccob.edu. We also have career link, which is found on sso.ccob.edu. And you just click on the chiclet that says career link. And you have access to not only job boards, but in mock interview tools, job search tools. Um, and that's where you can RSVP for all our events. Um, and you can book us for those one on one appointments on Beach Connect. Um, we are also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and we actually announce a lot of our events through those channels. So we always recommend our students to connect via there if you want to be updated on some of the things we're doing on that week or some of the big events that we have um, when it comes to like uh, career exploration and preparation. And then the final thought that I always love to leave our students, especially because I know it could be a little stressful with um, with figuring out um, your career, right? And and thinking about these things. And I love this quote from uh, from Munoz that says, "Whether the first in our families to attend college, enter a traditional workspace, or embark on a non traditional path, we have forged new roads, often without the role models of our own, because we had no other choice. There was nobody that looked like us or grew up like us uh, taking on these roles before we did. Our stories have rarely not been written because they are still unfolding. So very much in line." Um, don't feel that you're alone. You have a strong community that is first generation that has their story still to be unfolded. And so when you're thinking about how do I get started? Who do I go to? One, I hope that you can connect with me. Um, email me. Uh, there is never a time where I haven't gotten a student yet to, to book an appointment with me if you really, really need to see me. Um, we are your community. So um, whether you are still a student or you're about to graduate this December or May, this is your community and your community doesn't leave you, even at the height of these anxieties. So please, um, as you're watching this recording, um, you know, feel free to email me, tell me how you're doing. If you want to chat, if you don't have a question, that is perfectly fine. We can just chat and sit and be in that space um, and feel the space and feel whatever you need to talk about. Um, but that's something that I definitely wanted to share how we as a career center continue to provide um, career services, uh, you know, while you're still a student and one year after graduation. So um, I'll definitely turn it back. That was kind of like our quick like presentation of our services. Um, but uh, again, uh, please feel free to always reach out. Um, it is your space. So um, please, please take advantage of it. So um, Rosa, for the for the career anxiety, do I have to do the whole webinar or can you can you give me the can you give me the the, the short version? How do I solve yes. career anxiety? <laughs> and you know what? It's so funny because in our presentation um, in collaboration with CAPS, we really uh, ventured into thinking about feeling your feelings. And so what does that mean? It means that sometimes depending on how you have processed trauma. So this might be a, a good a good conversation to have about trauma. Depending on how you've processed in the past, you may be the kind of person that says, okay, I feel anxious and that's it. And so a lot of the techniques that we kind of like introduced were like, well, when you're feeling anxious, how do you sit with that feeling? One is naming it. Sometimes it's hard to name that feeling. So if you're like, am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling worried? Um, so sometimes even Googling a list of feelings and going through and saying, am I feeling this? And feeling your feelings is like feeling the anxiety and then slowly letting it go, letting it pass. And so sometimes when you first, that's like the first technique we tend to um, 
we tend to talk about. Oh, that is so cool. Um, and then the other, the other technique that we also put in there is um, one, as you're kind of addressing these feelings, you want to start transitioning to what do I have at my disposal? Because if you're an overthinker, you tend to think in a futuristic way that may not be grounded with strategies. So a lot of the career anxiety can be like, I'm graduating in three weeks. I don't have um, a plan. People are going to say this. My family's going to ask me all these questions. I won't have answers to them. And you tend to overthink. So instead of that, we want to think, okay, Rosa just mentioned I can visit her. When can I book that appointment with her? So those are like the major two strategies we talked about, like saying, feel your feelings. So recognize that they're there let it go, do breathing techniques, um, but then also realize who is around you and what are the things that you can build around you to help you as you're processing. The anxiety may not completely go away um, because life is life and you might feel anxiety. It's when it's prolonged anxiety um, and like having those thought processes that, um, oh, sorry, I heard a little echo there. But when you start to, to feel that or sense that, that that's when we even turn to CAPS and say, what are some community um, resources that we can offer to our students um, to continue the process? Because some, some of our students actually use our services at the same time. They'll go to CAPS um, or have some sort of like counseling and therapy sessions while also working on their career. Um, so those are those are some of the things that we, we kind of covered. It was a unique... Um, workshop um, and hopefully we if we get more interest we might um, we might see if there's future partnerships um, but that was something that a lot of our students were very thankful to kind of like see combined because it is a very unique um, topic so yeah yeah those are just some of the things we covered <laughs> and I you know I think I would say um, as, as Nicole mentioned everybody's path is going to be different but in my own case um, you know, after you're at it for a while, you do get more confident. There is less anxiety. Um, when I was a Disney art director, I think I made more money then than I've ever made since. So I'm actually making less money today. Uh, although I'm, you know, I, I think the work has been more personally interesting and satisfying. But you know, whatever your goals might be, I, I think time often helps. So, uh, Nicole, I think you have five more points for us. I do have five more points. Let's see if I can get them through in five minutes. I don't know about that. I'm not a good, okay, I'm going to share again. So three three o'clock is not a hard line. So you, you uh, Rosa might need to leave, but, uh, but you can take more than five minutes if you like. Okay. Um, there we go. I think we left off here. Um, I wanted to say too, on the point of, you know, everyone having their own path and thinking about kind of job anxiety. I, I, all of the jobs I have ever had were jobs that I got either through networking and nepotism. I'm going to be really upfront about that. That's like, you know, who do you know? And to um, like someone just kind of like passing on a tip, like, oh, hey, like there's this position, you might be good for it. So I was either invited to apply or they were jobs that I literally created the, the, the job description for myself. And I approached the company and I said, I think you need this. Here's what I would do if I was there. And that has worked. I was the chief curator of the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art because they didn't have a curator. Someone in town told me that they didn't have a curator. They didn't have a job description. They didn't post anything for it, nothing. I went and looked at their website. I dug through all of their programming and I was like, all right, if I was a curator here, this is what I would do. And I basically wrote a proposition, I wrote a proposal for them and I submitted it and I was hired almost immediately. So I was like, I think you, I think like be courageous and, and, and assertive, <laughs> um, prepare. So that five is prepare your portfolio, whatever, whatever field it is, like maybe if it's music, it's architecture, it's graphic design, but I would say have your portfolio kind of really nicely prepared. So that means good documentation of your work. It means having your resume or your CV kind of organized having kind of descriptions of your projects, if you're, if you're in the studio arts. Um, and I would say, if you are going to pursue being in studio arts, like create a database or an image management system for your work in some way that you can kind of keep updating it um, through time. 
Um, if you're interested in teaching develop, like there are, there are a lot of ways to go to kind of get experience teaching, um, including kind of signing up to be a substitute teacher in your local school district, look into getting credentialed and what that takes. You can take credentialing classes kind of often at night. Like I got my, I got an emergency teaching credential by taking night classes through the LA Unified School District. Um, you can volunteer at a museum education um, program. So all museums, like most museums and art centers have kind of community uh, programming and they do kind of weekend programs for families and free arts instruction. That's a great opportunity to kind of see how it's done. Even if you're just volunteering to like uh, assist the teacher in residence and see how they do it and how they, and how, how they write lesson plans, for example. Um, and then also most municipal um, city offices will have kind of arts programs that you can look into either uh, applying for or volunteering for at least to get some experience or to get some observation. So lots and lots of, I think like observation and um, um, asking people, you know, like ask people, how do they do it? How, the people that, you know, Rosa, Rosa mentioned mentors or people that are might, maybe are doing things that you wanna be doing, ask them, how did you do it? What did you start with? What were your fears when you started? How did you, you know, how did you take that first step? Um, and like we've been saying, there's a lot of different pathways. Everyone's going to come at their own um, career trajectory from, from their a unique direction, but um, you might, you might start to hear ideas that, that didn't occur to you um, before you asked. Talk about um, you know, before we go on to six, because I, I think Rosa might be needing to leave soon. Yeah. Um, let me ask you both. I just, you know, the pandemic, which I guess started on for me about the 13th of March 2020, and we're closing in on the end of year two now. Um, so obviously, it's this crazy public health turn political thing. Um, there's this vast universe of people who will never be vaccinated. There are people who are really trying to be careful and, and, and continuing isolation. It seemed like maybe things were getting a little better. Now, of course, we have the Omicron variant just to... So I, I just wanted to ask, do you have... Uh, Nicole, actually, you sort of touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but um, you know, I, I feel like this, this Zoom universe that we're in we were heading here before the pandemic anyway, and and that the pandemic, in a sense, I mean, it just kind of accelerated things. But do you have thoughts about you know whether it is a four year pandemic or just the the digital universe expanding itself? How how artists might be able or might need or could take advantage of the circumstances to work going forward? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I don't, I think this is an, an endemic. It's not going, there's no timeline on it. I think we're here. I don't think we're going, I don't think it's going to change. Um, sorry uh, for that, but um, I don't, I don't think it's going to be over. I don't think it's going to change. I think we're going to be in a hybrid world for, from here on out. Um, I think web 3.0 is, is really exciting. I think every company around is, is thinking about, um, yeah, here we go. Um, is thinking about Web 3.0, and there's there are a lot of possibilities there. I would say if there is like any like the, the most crucial piece of advice, I think that art art artistic, you know, I won't say just artists, but like creative creatives should do is like learn programming, um, and and get a financial advisor, like that. And like I, I don't know what else to say. Like I think like learn programming, get a financial advisor, and learn about investing. Even if you think you can't, you think you don't have anything, like invest ten dollars a month. Just start. Like I and I'm like I I actually think cryptocurrency is pretty exciting. I mean, there's I know that's very debatable, but um, I think cryptocurrency is an interesting way to go. And I think um, I think AR and immersive environments. I think there are so many applications, not just in the arts. I mean, I think it's going to be everywhere. I think it's you're you're going to see it in the in the kind of TV and movie industry. You're going to see it in the music industry. You're going to see it in business. You're going to see like immersive learning. You're going to see it in the classroom. So like if you can then get on even like Adobe Arrow, like you can you can start trade taking whatever your two dimensional stuff is right now and and convert it into immersive ar um and i think you're gonna have a real leg up i think that um i think the opportunities to have 
to have sponsorship and kind of create your own business online, whether it's your Instagram or TikTok or, or Snapchat or wherever is there are huge. And I think you shouldn't underestimate that. I also think you shouldn't anticipate that, that that is going to be a forever thing. I think that like, you're going to, you know, I have a former student who's super excited that he's real huge on TikTok, and I'm like, okay, and that's going to last six months max. Like, you know, you have to, you have to be ready to like, how is that going to morph into the next thing? That's what I would say about the Zoom. Awesome. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I, uh, say, I was about to say like, same, ditto. Um, I think the other thing that's coming up and I, I feel like y'all should, should be aware of is, um, burnout. That's a very hot topic across fields. Um, and so as you are going to be part of this like digital space to always question and, and ask yourself how, how can you take care as you're going into this new environment? Um, all companies are, are, are I, trying to address the great resignation um, and that we are asking as human beings to be treated a lot better in the workspace. Um, and so um, embrace that, lean into it. Um, when it comes to technology, one of the greatest things you all have as artists, creatives, performers, adaptability. So lean into that adaptability. You know you already know how to take in feedback and how to shift and change and pivot. So that's a skill you have just by being a creative um, more than maybe other majors on campus. Um, so when you start to see change, lean in. Um, and I and I think that's I, those are great tips. Like, yes, go into programming, go into things that are outside of maybe what typically people would think as creative, lean into entrepreneurship, lean into those things that are new and explore them. Never, I think that's the one thing I always tell students, never let that curiosity die because curiosity leads to learning and it leads to pivoting. So, so long as you lean to these things, you're always going to be on top of like the new technology, the new things while taking care of you. Um, but those are my thoughts. Like, I agree with you. I feel like the Zoom world is going to stay. Um, but then it's also going to ask us to think about how do we reconnect? How What does that connection look like? Um, so it may not be like we had in the past pre-COVID, but this is exciting. We get to we get to interact and view each other differently and connect with one another differently. So how is this digital space going to open up discussions about social justice, about humanity, about our own bias? Um, so these are things lean into. Don't be don't be afraid, or it's okay to be afraid, but don't let that stop you. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's the key thing. Lean in, lean into these possibilities and don't be afraid to venture into something else. Um, yeah, that would be my takeaway too. And I, I do have to dash, but awesome. it was wonderful sharing digital space with all of you. And for those of you that will be watching the video and you all have my contact information. So please feel free to connect and I'm here to support you as you discover who you are and, and enjoy that that journey of becoming. So. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay, point number six. Take it away. Yeah, you want to continue? All yeah, right. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, I mean, I think I think in in pretty like I don't know, maybe it doesn't seem like this, but like in real like nuts and bolts terms, like I uh oh did that work? Here we go. Um you know, I think we have to be pragmatic about it. Like if you need a job, you need a job, right? How do you, and, and yeah, there is burnout. There is a great, great resignation right now, but they also anticipate that people are going to change their minds in six months. <laughs> so I think like, uh, yeah, I, I don't blame people for wanting to leave their jobs, but I also think that, um, you have to, I mean, I'm, I don't know, unless, unless you have a trust fund, how do you live for that long? without getting some, without some income. Um, yep. but that's where the financial planning comes into play, right? Like, I mean, they say you're supposed to have enough savings that you could live without a job for six months. I mean, I, I don't, I don't have that. I'm not a, they still don't have that. So, um, maybe, maybe a couple months, but I don't know. So, um, 
Number six, my, my, my point number six is talk about art or fill in the blank, whatever your kind of discipline, whatever your area of interest is, talk about it, like engage in the world that you want to be in, whether it's gaming or music or design or social justice, like engage in that world and talk about it. Talk about what you're seeing, ask other people in the field, what they're seeing and doing, you know, talk, like just it can keep exercising your creative brain, but also can stay on top of what is what are the conversations in that um, in that field right now, and how might you contribute to that conversation with what you're doing? I I practice writing about art because I thought it was a good way, you know, to to get my ideas out in a different form too, um, and that eventually led to to jobs as a reviews writer, and I was able to, and I was also an editor for a local art magazine. Um, and that was really exciting too. I like that gave me uh, access to a different part of the art world that I didn't expect to ever see. I always thought I wanted to be written about, but, um, when I started writing about other people, um, I said it became a tool for me to write about, um, to give voice to, to the kinds of artists who I were, I was not seeing highlighted. I made a point of writing. I didn't write exclusively about women, but I made a point of writing about, underrepresented artists and artists who are doing kind of art that was a little bit outside the norms, if you will, um, because I wanted to see them supported um, and to get reviews in art forum or in the magazines that were big at the time. I ended up writing for magazines all over the world. So I wrote for Flash Art and Art de Contexto in Spain and um, uh, art, in art, art in America. And anyway, I, and I got a press pass when I was an arts writer. And that was actually probably more valuable than the very piddly pay they gave me to be an arts writer. Art writing doesn't pay well, or it didn't for me anyway. Um, but the press pass got me into museums for free. It got me into parties. It got me into like, it was this sort of social access point that was really important. And that let me make connections. So socialize is my next point. And, you know, some of the greatest kind of artists and entrepreneurs that um, I've seen talk about their pathway will say, network, go to cocktail parties. The most important thing you can do, like, you know, as an artist or an inventor or even a scientist is go to cocktail parties. And it's like, and I'm saying this is like, not as someone who, not because I want you to get free booze, but because I want you to like schmooze, schmooze, not booze, schmooze with people while you're there. Like the, the kind of, oh, it's a relaxed environment. People can be who they are. And you, you never know what kind of connections will come up in that way. Um, it's just crucial. So, and that can be really scary to do when you're like brand new and you're like, how do I know like where to go or how, you know, how do I get the invites? I spent years really anxious about like art week in Miami at Art Basel Miami because all the parties and this and that and everyone, it looked so fancy. And honestly, you can just walk into most of them. I just, but people don't because they don't know. They think it has, it's like, there's this gatekeeping. So, so there's like fake it till you make it is kind of a, a mo another motto of mine, which is like, um, just pretend like you belong and then you'll belong. Like you did pretend like you were invited. And then the people aren't going to be the wiser, to be honest. So the art world or the world is a lot smaller than you think. Um, I, I just did this project with Playboy and lo and behold, a former student was my editor, right? Like the 10 years later, it's tiny. The, the world is tiny. You will kind of come back across, um, the, the same people again and again. So the more that you're networking, stay in touch with each other. The people you're in class with right now, like are going to be one of your greatest assets. You have the opportunity to help each other. It's crucial. It really is like I am. And I'm still like the people that I was an undergrad with at UC San Diego in the early nineties, I'm still good friends with. They're some of my best friends and they're incredible. They're not all artists. One's in a, a, a world changing geneticist. One is a, um, a family business owner. One is an economist, but we are, we, and we've helped each other. The geneticist is doing, helping me do work on my new project where I'm kind of turning my genetic code into a, um, a self-portrait. So um, stay in touch with each other. Tell people what you're doing and what you're looking for. Um, make it known. Make it known that you're looking for a job. Like make it known that you want to be, that you're looking for a studio. Make it known that you are, you know, working on art about you know, trees, whatever it is. 
make it known because then like people will have in their mind, like when they're curating another show, when a job opens up at a gallery, when someone uh, has to leave their studio space, and they need someone else to take over the lease. Then people have like, oh yeah, Joe said that he needed a space. Like, so um, it'll be known. Like, I think a lot of times we assume that people know stuff because we post it on social media, right? We assume that the world knows everything because we've posted about it. Um, but that's not true, right? There are, there are, everyone is seeing a gazillion things a day. Um, so you might have to make some specific efforts to kind of make things known about, about your needs and about what you're working on, about your interests. Um, and, can, and, and similarly with your portfolio materials, with your cover letters, with reaching out to people, I think um, you are in this interesting position right now because you're digital natives. And you've grown up in a world where every action you make has your like username attached to it, right? Like, so you make a post, you send a message or whatever your username is attached to that. But I can't tell you the amount of times that I get um, resumes or requests from people who don't tell me who they are. And I'm like, if I'm looking to hire someone and I get, I have to download, you know, 45 resumes and I'm going to, I'm, I'm like, I, I kid you not, I get resumes with no name on them because people have emailed their resume and they think that like, oh, it's, you know, coming from me. I, those are the first ones that I throw out. So like make sure like be just like take a step back for a minute and, and be keep in mind that, you know, people don't know who you are when you're contacting them. You ha- let them know who you are. Like. Um, and I think like, uh, as Rosa was saying, like self-care is really important. Like, don't forget about pleasure and joy and humor and generosity. And, and, and you can do that with each other, right? Like you're all in class right now. You're all about to graduate. You can say, you know, have a, have a study group. Some of my former students used to have, um, they called it shed night. One of them had this like shed, this kind of garage shed in their backyard. And once a month they would have shed night. And it was sort of like an informal like critique and sketchbook night. And sometimes they do movies. Sometimes they would like do performances for each other. And, and, and there's three of them are still kind of working and living and do and intersecting now in the art world in, in different ways, but they're also really good friends. Um, so like our, build your own, build your own community events in ways that, that will sustain you in, in ways that kind of, that bring you joy and pleasure. Um, I think sometimes we think about like critiques in art school as being really miserable. So like, can you do a, a critique, um, that is positive? I, so that's, you know, my next slide is like self-care, physical and mental health, um, food, breath, exercise. I mean, it sounds so basic, but it's crucial. Um, I like to think about what I call dirt learning. I think the effects of, of all this screen time, whether it's on our phones or our laptops or tablets or whatever, it, it affects everything. It affects our posture. It affects our, our, our mental health. It affects our attention span. So like in whatever way you can engage in dirt learning, which is like gardening, growing something, even having a plant, you don't have to have a plot of, of a yard to do a garden. You could do a hanging plant in your house, in your apartment, put it by the window, um, see what it takes to like grow a thing. Just try to grow sprouts, you grow sprouts under the sink. Um, so I think like, and, and, you know, if you can get out and like hike or camp or um, just explore, I think dirt learning is a whole, it's really different. There's, there's um, pedagogues like Maria Montessori or Neil Summer, like these kind of people who invented learning styles who advocate that, you know, that students should spend a minimum of one year learning on the outside. Um, and we've just gotten rid of that entirely. Uh, so like Maria Montessori thought that students should spend a minimum of one year during the ages of like puberty, like, like from 11 to 14, they should spend at least one year learning only outside. Just learn about like the systems and cycles of the world, like learn about your relationship to the weather, learn about different like time cycles. I recently learned about Norwegian folk schools, which sound like my dream place to go. They are, they, they occur for one year. It's immersive. It's non-academic. 
And each person is encouraged to go and learn about something that brings them joy. And so there's several schools to choose from. There's a site you can look at and Google it, like Norwegian folk schools. I don't know how much it costs, to be honest. I don't know anything about doing it logistically because I don't have a free year right now, but I hope sometime in the future to do it. Like these, like learning, so it's back to joy. Like what would it, how, what would you do if someone said, I want you to spend a year studying something that brings you joy? How, I mean, that would be a game changer. So like there's, I think I'm close to the end. There's, I mean, I think there's no- you know, um, just on, on, uh, Marissa Mayer uh, said that you cannot understand Google unless you understand that Larry and Sergey were both Montessori kids. Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, I grew up a hippie kid too, so maybe that's part of my mindset. Um, I don't think there's, I think we, we often kind of have these benchmarks in our mind of like, oh, you know, once I make $100,000 a year, or once I get into the Whitney Biennial, or once I buy this car, that like that's going to be it, right? Um, but get, if you're lucky, that's not it. Like your life will keep going. And so like, I would say, I would encourage you not to think about things in terms of these like end game benchmarks, but rather like it's, again, it's super cheesy, but it's, it is about, it is the journey. It's about the journey and it's about being in the here and now. It's like, this is, this is it. This is where you're at. Like when people talk about school as being not real life, I don't get that. Like it's such, it's so real. It is real. Like this is your real experience right now. Um, it's not like you've been living a fake experience. And then when you graduate, then the real stuff is going to start. Like you're living it. You're in it. You're in life right now. <laughs> um, and that will always be true until you die. And then you won't be living life. Right. So I, I would encourage you whatever you can to like, think about being, you know, artists aren't immortal. Um, but they also shouldn't be disposable. This is a piece I did trying to get rid of myself, like having talk about imposters, imposters in them. Um, there's a lot of different resources. I don't know um, if you have, if you know about them already, but actually that's all I think is, it's still happening, but I wouldn't recommend it right now. But like um, NYFA actually has opportunities, jobs and residences and things listed, mostly for New York City, but sometimes all over the country. Um, there's Res Artists, which is like an international, let's see if I put it here. Yeah, um, resartists.org. I know you talked about resident wanting to know about residencies and internships. Resartists.org kind of lists residencies all over the world and, and from all different kinds of parameters. You can choose like a two week residency or a year long residency. Um, you can search by how long they are, where they are, how much they cost. Some of them charge you money and some of them give you money. Um, the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice, Italy has an, an amazing internship program that is paid. Um, and they pay you at, like not a ton, but they pay you enough to like live in Venice and learn. I did that program and um, I just the other day re-met one of the people that I did the program with 30 years ago and he's now a curator in Montana and we have a mutual friend and we were talking. So it's like, there's a network, right? That has lasted my whole life. So I think residencies are also an incredible way to build, to expand your network, to meet, meet artists and creatives from all around the world. Um, don't work for free. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, volunteering and, and internships are often for free, but I don't, I think that um, unless you're getting class credit for an internship, you shouldn't do it for free. Um, you should either be getting credit or you should be getting paid. I think that there is a real system of exploiting labor for people who can afford to work for free and, and for, and, and you shouldn't feel pressured to do it. Um, if you do have an internship, the opportunity to do an internship or to get a paid internship, um, I think it's an amazing opportunity to, uh, like your job once you're there is to be like a spy. You should pay attention to everything. Like how do they do their how do they do their budgeting? How do they have their contact lists like organized? You know who are the key people for that business? Whether it's a gallery or an independent business or graph design firm or whatever. You know like what programs do they use to set up the back end of their business? Um, how what are their what are the business ethics in that workplace? Like how are they how do they run? How is it the day to day to work there? You know, are they are they stringent um, with you know people starting on time, or is it a more flexible schedule? I think it's a great opportunity to observe like how how a business is built, um, 
how they operate, how they make connections. Um, we talked about residencies. I think that's, I mean, I was gonna, I like, I went through all of my, I have this thing where I go through like all the crap that I did, all the humbling weird jobs. Um, you've, you've talked about a lot, but actually it's, it's, you've done, it's amazing how much, how much interesting work you've produced. So yeah, it, it's, it's a lot, it's very impressive. Um, wow, thank you. That's quite, that's quite a compliment coming from you. Ooh. Oh. Oh, we okay. have a new immersive a little fireside. Yeah, a little fireside chat. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. Do you have are there quite are there, I feel like I kind of rushed through some things. Are there questions or follow-up? Um, uh, it was it was fast, but it was a lot of actually really good information, I think. So um I hope. Oh, look at the zooming in and out. Oh there we go. Oh. Fireside chat. <laughs> Um, the toasty already, where I should have put the marshmallows. Um, here we go. I can do it this way. Yeah, that works. <laughs> network, 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 and plan. And that's, you know, I don't know. I think those are like get your portfolio materials in order or your job application materials in order, you know, and do it now. Like it's do it when you're not uber stressed out. Like don't do it in the four hours before the deadline to apply for something happens. You know, you know like, I've, I've sat in, uh, I, I'm sure you've been there, you know, Long Beach State, at least when it's not a pandemic, has a, a big gallery complex of five galleries in a circle. Um, and I've sat in the gallery and, you know, late one night before the show opens and listened to a student like on their laptop saying how much they hate writing artist statements. And I sort of think, well, that's because you've been making art for months, if not years, and you've been installing for a week. And now six hours before the show opens, you're writing a statement and you hate it because you haven't given yourself the opportunity to really think. I mean, the statement is a really incredible thing. Even if nobody ever reads it, like you now have the ability to talk a, a, a little bit more coherently about your work. Yeah. Um, but as you say, you know, if, if you're doing it four hours before it's due, that's not any fun. And, and it's not no, going to be. You're not going to think well about it either. You know, I don't think you won't think clearly about it. I mean, the best thing I ever did for myself was to, to develop this kind of online portfolio. It's just a Google folder, Google Drive folder of materials that I could access on my phone. Like, and so if I, if I got a request for something, or let's say I was in a show and there was a press opportunity, I could send over images and a statement like from my phone. I could be like, here's link. And I, can, I just would like organize a few things. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull these three pictures and send this over. Um, and, and I think it's been really, it has meant that I've gotten opportunities that I wouldn't have had if I didn't have those available for them to highlight. Like, and it goes back to the idea of making things easy for people, like make it easy for people to help you, make it easy for them to hire you, make it easy for them to um, promote you to write about your work, to write you a letter of recommendation. If it's easy, if you're like, oh, here, here's what you need. You know, my, my, pro my working, my collaboration with Playboy this last week has been really fun because I, it was very last minute and unexpected. I was not ready for it. I didn't necessarily have the time. I carved it out because I was like, this is a cool opportunity. And everywhere, every step along the way, I just said, you know, is that like, I tried to, to, to anticipate what they would need and what format they would need it in and do it before they asked. And, um, and that meant that they're now really excited to work with me on another project. And so, which was also a surprise, but, but I was like, oh, great. Um, and, and I wasn't, I, I feel like um, being flexible and being accommodating, um, meant that meant that it opened up opportunities rather than closed them down so yeah that's that's fantastic so that's awesome great story congratulations hope it hope it continues to go and um really so many great ideas important ideas from you and from from rosa and you know i think the, the students in the class are, are, are all over the map some have a very clear vision of exactly where they're heading many do not you know it's much more uh, think I'm heading here, don't know if I'm, you know, there is kind of the imposter syndrome, don't know if I'm worthy thing. And- um, Okay, I wanna say something for, um, well, two things. Uh, there's always gonna be people that are more qualified than you and there are always gonna be people that are less qualified than you. 
Like, you know, you can spin your head around about it all as much as you want, but the fact is like, there are how many billions of people in the world right now? And it's like, there are a lot of really amazing people. You're just one of those people, right? Like you're one of um, literally billions. Um, and and you can sabotage yourself if if you want. Sure, that's op- That's an option. Um, but the, a mantra that I give to myself all the time, and this is, you know, it's a little bit sexist, uh, but as I look at the legacies of history and who gets who gets the opportunities and the privilege and who who is unafraid, who ignores their imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome and just like steps up are the mediocre white men. And so the like I, I had that saying of like, you know, have the confidence, move forward with the confidence of a mediocre white man. Um, because it, it's just, I mean, look at our presidents. Um, it, it's not an impressive list. A lot of mediocre white men there, and they got to be president. So I like to think about that. Like in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pretend like I have the entitlement that I I don't I don't naturally feel myself this entitlement. But if I imagine the entitlement, like if I don't assert like my desire and need to be somewhere, someone else will, and it's someone who might even care less about it. Um, and that would be even worse, right? For me to see someone else who cared less about an opportunity get the opportunity that I wanted because of my imposter syndrome. So there's that. And then the other thing is, um, this is a secret, don't post it online, okay. is have, give yourself, you know, I don't know if anybody when they were little had an invisible friend, like did you have like an imaginary friend um, I live in a world of imaginary friends. Right? So um, I I gave my childhood imaginary friend a professional upgrade um, to being my imaginary studio assistant. And my imaginary studio assistant is really good at saying no. They're really good at bossing people around when like an invoice hasn't been paid. Um, they're very good at saying, you know, Nicole's not available right now, but I'm here to schedule a meeting, you know, for when she is available. So until such a time as when I can afford a real person to do that, I have an imaginary person to do that who has access to my email, but they sign it with a different name and they have a different, and so, um, it has been really amazing what my student assistant has been able to do and get that I would not be able to do myself. You know, there's all kinds of research with avatars walking around in virtual worlds. And and if you make your avatar taller, suddenly you're more assertive. Uh, There's a lot of amazing things like that. So the imaginary studio assistant is new to me, but it's it's a really interesting, amazing idea that I will tell no one. I can, well, your students don't tell, I mean, do it, but do it, but don't like say anything, all right? Because then that'll blow my cover. For my imagine, you know, but I I told a curator this once, and 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 he was like, "Are all the big artists do that?" And I was like, "What? Like nobody told me." I was like, "What?" Um, it's like so these secrets. There's like these trade secrets that, that people don't tell you. And like here, I thought I was so clever. I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and he was like, "Oh yeah." Like so, um, my assistant is um, they're they're non-binary. I have I, you know, I have bio for them. Um, I suppose if I, I should kind of create a, a like traceable background. So if people want to look them up, they could see what kind of work they do and what their resume is. But, um, but I haven't needed that yet. I love that. But it's also like, I mean, as, and, I, and here's another kind of gender stereotyping thing, but, but as, you know, as a, um, as a, as a female artist and as someone who really, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't grow up with a trust fund. I didn't grow up with family support. I didn't have like it, it, emotional or financial. I, um, I kind of just had to figure everything out myself. Um, and sometimes I was given good advice and sometimes not good advice from like my faculty, my own, my professors in school or my friends. And, um, I, so I sometimes have a hard time saying no and, and experimenting with this, you know, not alter ego, but with this assistant, I can give the assistant permission to do things that I wouldn't be able to do myself. And it's sort of an interesting 
it's an inter it's interesting. Like it, it has helped me become better at saying no in my own, in my own right, uh, by being able to practice it through Tam, because I don't, if, 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 if my assistant does it first, you know, and like, I, I have no investment in like, if someone reacts weirdly to them, you know, and then, but now I see like, they can put it out there and put their foot down and be assertive. And actually what happens is like, you know, I get higher honoraria, I get better scheduling, I get, you know, so that has now encouraged, has, has emboldened and empowered me to do, to do that. And, you know, it's funny, I mean, this is a, this is a fantastic um, uh, professional tool, career tool, but I honestly, I just love it as a, as a storytelling experience, the idea yeah. of, you know, creating this character, and I would go, nuts and get them their own Twitter account and be stupid about yeah, it. Yeah, I should, I should. I can't even manage my own social. So like, I, you know, it's, I'm, I can't keep up with most things, but it, it's, it came about because I realized that when I, when I was curator at the museum in Utah and I was, you know, having to write a lot of emails kind of request, like loan requests and different, like basically having to ask a lot of institutional favors of other institutions and other professionals in the field. I, it occurred to me in a couple of cases, it was very clear that people were who didn't know me already were, were interpreting my name to be male. Um, mm. and they reacted to me as Mr. Hebron and they treated me notably differently when they thought I was male versus when they thought, when they learned I was female. Like, I mean, it was, it was almost a joke. Like when I would, when I would say like, well, I'd either sign off, like, you know, with a feminine, you know, honorific or whatever, or I would say like, oh, you know, I'm actually female, but you know, thanks for your email. And they would literally start like mansplaining or telling me how to do my job or saying no to my requests where they had actually said yes previously. And I'm like, wow. It was, it was remarkable. It was truly remarkable. And so that gave me the idea. I'm like, all right, screw this. Like I'm going to create an, an identity, identity of someone else who is like, you know, gender ambiguous and, and more assertive and businessy than I am. And they're just going to get, they're going to do the yucky stuff for me. <laughs> um, you know, this is such a great idea, but it's also a good opportunity. I think just to, re to remind everyone that, um, you know, hopefully if you get a rejection or someone isn't helpful, it isn't because of your gender, ethnicity, whatever, but whatever happens, try not to take it personally. It yeah. isn't about you. Um, you know, it's hard to, to have doors not open and still be kind of optimistic, but, but try to do that if you can. Um, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's easy. This is, it's easy to kind of get beat down and, and at yeah. the very least, don't take it personally. Just keep pressing on ahead. I think I think that's. I mean, rejections are the worst, right? And so, so I think it's one of the things that I had in my presentation. I mean, that I've gotten to is like practice applying for stuff. You know, they say the best time to apply for a job is when you don't need one, um, or when you don't want it. Is like so, just practice applying for stuff. Apply for grants. Apply for jobs. Just like think of it as practice. So then you're not as psychologically invested or as emotionally invested, but you're also like, it's, I mean, I, you know, the stats are pretty, pretty tough. Like there are a lot, there are, there are a few positions for a lot of people who want jobs. And so I think it's good to cast a wide net, um, consider jobs that you may be surprised about. Like when I got that conservation job, you know, I, I didn't, I was like, I don't want to be like fixing stuff. It's so meticulous. And you know, I'm not, I'm a messy, like clumsy person. Um, but in that job, like one of my, one of my tasks was to go around and change the like barometer to reset the, um, these barometers, these kind of devices that these temperature and humidity devices that were in the rooms of every gallery in the museum at LACMA. So that meant every week, part of my job was to walk through every gallery in the museum. And I, it was a dream for me. I was like, oh my God, like my job is to get paid to go, go walk through every gallery of the museum, you know? So I think cast a wide net, apply to things and like anticipate that you, you will get rejections. It's okay. Like to apply again, you know, and use each other as a peer network to kind of read over your cover letters or to do mock interviews with each other as goofy as it sounds. It really helps run through things with someone else, you know, ahead of time. Um, 
and see how you sound, or even just record yourself, you know, record yourself, do a mock interview with a friend and record yourself and watch it as hard as that sounds. It will give you a lot of good information. It will, you know, you'll see like, are you making eye contact? Is your posture, you know, how's your posture? Do you stumble over your words? Do you say, um, too much? Um, um. <laughs> Practice on these things is so, you know, if you only go for the one interview for the thing that you desperately want, that's so much pressure. And if yeah. you manage to, to do a lot of interviews, you know, the first one is kind of rough. The second one, by the time you get to number five, number 10, it's like, it's not that big a deal. It's like, you're, you're just getting better at it. You're more comfortable with yourself and you're more comfortable with your words. Um, you know, I used to do uh, a, a radio arts interviews at Long Beach State. Um, and I remember interview, actually uh, choreographers I, I happened to be talking to because there was a dance concert that week. And the undergrad, it was a really interesting difference between the undergrads and the grads, not to you know, say that you can't be amazing at any level, but the undergrads were doing pretty interesting work. But when you ask them questions, they had a harder time answering them. I think even though they were serious about the dance and their choreography, they just hadn't talked about it that much. And the grad students, they're just a few years older. And I think there'd been more occasions when they had to say something about their ideas. And so, you know, they were just so much more fluent with, with that. And I, I think exactly as you say, you know, the more interviews, the more cocktail parties, you know, try not to bore people to death going on forever, but, but say a little bit about what you're interested in, what you're exploring. Um, and yeah. you just get better and better. And asking questions that like learn to ask questions. I mean, I think if you do a job interview, asking quite like have a question, have questions prepared for the people you're interviewing with, because that will show that you've invested in like, what is the job? What is the company? Don't ask them dumb stuff that like, you know, how many people are on your team when there's like four people in the room and you're like, oh, um, but asking, you know, about their philosophy or, you know, or about like the you know, what they think is like the, the greatest asset that they provide to the, to their employees. Or, you know, there's like, I think kind of showing interest in something and showing how to ask a carefully crafted question is, is a really good skill to have. Awesome. All right. So much good. So many good ideas, Nicole. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Good um, luck, everybody. And, you know, I've said this to my students before, but I'll, I'll say it again, that um, I, I don't need there to be more artists in the world. There are plenty. So if somebody happens to get an art degree and then chooses to do something else, I'm totally fine with that. I don't mind at all. But what I feel like my mission with this class is, is that if you get an art degree and would like an art career, but you're afraid that, again, that you're not worthy or you don't know how to do make it happen, that I don't want that to just be a piece of paper and then you go off and have some business career, not because that's not fulfilling, but you know, I, I think an art career is actually possible. I think you and Rosa have given us a lot of great information on how to make that happen. And so I would just encourage people that you can actually put it together uh, if you want to. It's so true. And they're lucky, they're lucky to be able to be in dialogue with you about this. Okay, let me push the stop recording button. Thank you, Nicole. Thank, Thank you, Rosa. You. Bye. Uh,